moment of praise. Now, I know it is early. I was saying to somebody just earlier today, this morning, and this was during the time that they were rolling the stone away. We wasn't, nobody was up but them. So, at this point, it was, uh, we're in this place that means God has shown us grace and mercy. We ask that you sing this and actually have it in your heart. There's nothing but the blood of Jesus that can purify and make us whole once again.
Reverend Hagler. Good morning. Reverend Robertson. Good morning. Reverend Jordan. Good morning. Morgan Taylor. Good morning. Musicians. Good morning. Members and friends. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. That is pretty good for losing an hour. Yeah. Ah. Pretty good for losing an hour. Uh, my name is Jan Beckwith, and I am a member of the Greetest Ministry, and I would like to take this opportunity to welcome our guests. I have no guests registered this morning, but there is someone sitting over here in the corner that I've never seen before, so we're just going to welcome him. He's right over this corner. <laughs> over this corner. And he drums for us sometimes. Yes, so I understand he has a talent as well. Yes. So we are just thankful to have you this morning, young man. Yes, we are. And joining us. Um, I don't know whether you all know this. Um, I'm kind of a bit, you know, I like the, the backstory. I, you know, I sometimes share with you the backstory. But today is March 8th, and this is actually the day that International Women's Day is always celebrated every year. And its origins go back to 1909. And it actually became a national holiday, believe it or not, in Russia in 1917 after the, women's, after the women gained suffrage. Now today it ranges from a public holiday to also being largely ignored. However, in America, back in 1987, the month of March was declared Women's History M Month. And it is a month to encourage and commemorate the study and celebration of the vital role of women in American history. So having said all that, this morning, I'd like to leave you with a prayer for the women. Dear God, I pray for each and every woman today. Thank you for creating her in your image, yes. for giving her purpose wherever she is at. I pray that you would give her the strength, courage, and boldness to face whatever is in her path today and the days ahead. I pray that you will reveal yourself to her in a fresh, tangible way, reminding her that she is loved from the inside out, no matter what. Send her a reminder today, something big, maybe something small, Whatever it takes to let her know she is never alone. Amen. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you. That it's okay, the, in light of world events, to give each other a fifth See? Song or a live long and prosper uh, <laughs> Star Trek fan. So um, we want to pass the peace of God. May the love and the peace of God be with you. And also with you.
uh, and they're a whole lot of hysteric also out there. And uh, we can either decide to allow ourselves to be ruled by hysteria, which is not necessarily uh, a great way to live. Or um, we can live in such a way that, uh, that we continue to express our faith, but still live with the caution. Yeah. Right, because there's stuff out there, we know that. Yeah. Uh, and out of the school that believe that folks have messed with the environment so bad that there are viruses that are manifested basically throughout the destruction of the world. Because when you look at if you look at where uh, this virus is supposed to have emanated from, it's a highly industrialized region. Right where basically corporations of the world have gone and cited there uh, because of the goods that can be produced, which is one reason why you have viruses, but also the other reason why you have shortages of goods. Because once uh, places like China have closed down, uh, you've also closed down the manufacturing mm -hmm. of a lot yeah. of goods. And so uh, let's be mindful because it reminds us that in this era of globalization, just how small the world is. Yeah. Right? So you're not talking about over there any longer, because over there is over here. That's right. yeah. uh, and so that's the way the world has constructed itself. And so we're called to be people of faith, yeah. but also people who are aware and are able to process the information that is before us. Now we're going to take some, uh, a, a time of great joy in our churches where we receive someone into membership who has come forth and expressed mm -hmm. a desire to unite in Plymouth Church. And I want to invite forth Irish Neil Samuel. How do you pronounce that? Samuel? Samuel? Or Samuel? Dorsanio. I will get it right, right? Dorsanio. <laughs> us and hold us 
and we ask that you hold each one of us accountable to the growth and in this ministry that we are submitting and committing to at this particular time. God, we ask you to continue to be with us and we with you. We ask it all in your prayer, in your name we pray. Amen. 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 Congregation, you may be seated. I extend you the right hand of fellowship and welcome you formally into the book of Amen.
as well. So I uh, want to invite you on 29th of March, right? 29th of March, you get a uh, Bible trivia? Yes. Yes, on the 29th of March, so keep your eye on that as well. This is in your book. Uh, so uh, uh, it's a time in which we spend time fellowshipping, laughing, having, uh, just rejoicing together. So come and be a part of that. Um, Valbert Lucas, who is uh, been, uh, a, a member of the church, his mother yeah. has been a long time member of the church, passed yesterday. His mother, sister Lucas, uh, he called me uh, as I came into Deacon's meeting yesterday to let me know that that had happened. So uh, I know that they're looking towards the services uh, being at Plymouth. There's nothing scheduled yet, but it's, uh, it's in the conversation. Okay. So pray for the Lucas family uh, during this time. Of loss in this time of grief. It's now the time that we prepare to bring our tithes, our gifts, and our offering into God's house. Let us be generous and faithful with it. Remember that we also have a second offering. The second offering is the Benevolence Fund that will be raised and lifted up by members of the diagonal and will come around uh, the second time to receive that offering. I'm going to ask that our uh, trustees come forth right now. If you uh, want to give by credit card or debit card, you can see. Um, Jeremy there. <laughs> Thank you. Amen. I, I want to go Emmanuel, but I, I, I don't know why I want to go Emmanuel. I knew it wasn't Emmanuel, but that was the one that popped up in my head. Amen. I guess another biblical right name, right? Yeah. Amen. Amen. Let us offer our prayers, Lord. We thank you now for the ability and the privilege to give. Yeah. For you have given to us in so many wonderful and profound ways. And so, Lord, when we come to this time of giving, we give out of a spirit of great gratitude, thankfulness, and joy for all that you have done and all you will do. And all these things we pray yeah. in Jesus' name.
morning, church. Good morning. I am going to read the first woman's contribution, and you can follow along as I read. Ella Josephine Baker was born on December 13, 1903, in Norfolk, Virginia. She grew up in North Carolina, where she developed a sense for social justice early. Hearing stories from her grandmother, Josephine Elizabeth Ross, about the oppressive culture of enslaved people and life as an African-American woman would help develop Baker's knowledge of the injustices an African-American face in society and motivate her own activism. Baker studied at Shaw University in Raleigh, North Carolina. As a student, she challenged school policies that she thought were unfair. After graduating in 1927 as class valedictorian, she moved to New York City and began joining social activist organizations. In 1930, she joined the Young Negro Cooperative League, whose purpose was to develop black economic power through collective planning. She also involved herself with several women's organizations. She was committed to economic justice for all people. In 1940, Ella Baker began her involvement with the NAACP. She worked as a field secretary and then served as director of branches from 1943 until 1946. Baker moved to Atlanta in 1957 to help organize Martin Luther King Jr.'s new organization, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, SCLC. She also ran a voter registration campaign called the Crusade for Citizenship. On February 1, 1960, a group of black college students from North Carolina AT&T University. a and a and thank you so much. Ref- <laughs> University refused to leave a Woolworths lunch counter in Greensboro, North Carolina, where they had been denied service. Ms. Mm-hmm. Baker left the SCLC after the Greensboro sit-ins because she wanted to assist the new student activists. She organized a meeting at Shaw University on Easter weekend for the student leaders of the sit-ins. From the meeting, the Southern Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, was formed. Adopting the Gandhian theory of nonviolent direction action, SNCC members joined with activists from the Congress of Racial Equality Corps to organize the 1961 Freedom Rides. With Ella Baker's guidance and encouragement, SNCC became one of the foremost activists for human rights in the country. Her influence was reflected in the nickname she acquired, Fande, a Swahili word meaning a person who teaches a craft to the next generation. Ella Baker continued <coughs> to be a respected and influential leader in the fight for human and civil rights until her death on December 13, 1986, her 83rd birthday. Mm. 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 Mm.
John 1. That is on 924, I'm sorry. All right, so now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born anew, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man born when he, be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born anew. The wind blows where it wills, and you will hear the sound of it. But you do not know whence it comes or whither it goes. Yeah. So it is with every one who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can this be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand this? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen. But you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven, but he who has descended from heaven the Son of Man, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God sent the Son into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. May God bless the reading of his word.
Gordon and Reverend yeah. Robertson and Deacons and all the fabulous musicians that are over there. It seems to be growing every week. Praise the Lord for you. And I uh, want to just also thank the congregation for uh, celebrating uh, my birthday last Sunday. Yeah. It was a tremendous birthday. It made me feel old. <laughs> But I really, really am just thankful from the bottom of my heart. Uh, I don't think I've ever had a celebration like that in my life. And so I just want to thank each and all of you for just the ways in which you contributed and thought of me and thought of uh, my 40 years of ministry, ordained ministry, and my 27 years at Plymouth here, and, and my 66th birthday. Amen? I got a hard time saying 66, but I, 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 I'll practice it and it'll roll off sooner or later easy off my tongue, right? It's, uh, it's, it's interesting how, how certain things sort of get your attention in a different kind of way, and that's one that's gotten my attention in a different kind of way, so I got to get used to it. I want to invite you to join with me in a moment of prayer. Um, Lord, we come to you and we just give you thanks for this text, this word from John that is open to us and give us the ability, Lord, to not only read it, but to perceive what it might be saying to us in this time in which we stand, these moments in which we live. For one thing is certain, Lord, and that is that you are the potter and we are the clay, so mold and shape us as you would have us to be until we are perfectly fitted for your kingdom. And Lord, as we come to this teaching time, you develop it. You send it forth as you see fit. Allow it all to be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, our Lord and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. You know, your eyes are open for things in different ways. And as you sang that song, it is well with my soul. In 2014, I went back to Palestine and I was in Jerusalem. And it was this hotel that they put me up the first night, because we were arriving at a strange time, and, and it was called the American Colony Hotel. And, and you know, it was such, such a strange name in Jerusalem, the American Colony Hotel. And the rooms were all very strangely designed. I mean, some of them were small, some of them were large, some of them were, had nooks and stuff in it. And, and I realized what it was eventually as I wandered the hallways because I kept seeing embedded in the walls and in picture frames parts of that hymn, It Is Well With My Soul. And I'm going, well, why is this hymn all over the place? Well, one of the biggest benefactors of the American colony wasn't always a hotel. It was a communal place where people lived to try to soak up the holiness of the land. And so there was an American colony, there was a Portuguese colony, there was a Spanish colony. This was the Ameri It was a businessman who had lost his children in a, um, in a ship that sunk. And, uh, and as he was traveling over the spot where the ship went down, the words, it is well with my soul, welled up in his spirit. And he penned the words to that hymn. And so since he was a central part of the American colony there, it was, that hymn was all over the, the place. You couldn't escape it, right? If you didn't know the hymn, uh, you were going to know it by the time you left that, that, that facility. And so, you know, and, and again, it's sort of like that was a part of the story that I had heard, but I never really, really heard it until I was standing in that place and was confronted with it in a whole different and historical way. Which says, you know, sometimes we got to have new eyes yeah. on old situations. All right. We got to have a, a, a new vision with which to see things. Right. Now, I, I'm lifting that up because it actually relates to what I'm talking about here. Because this is a pivotal scripture here in the third chapter of John for Christianity. This is also, the story is also unique to John. The conversations and the interactions between Jesus and Nicodemus exist in none of the other Gospels. 
It is only unique to John. John knows something about Nicodemus that the other writers of the Gospels seem not to know. Nicodemus is a Pharisee. And he is not only a Pharisee, but he is part of the high religious council of the day. Nicodemus sat on what was known as the Sanhedrin. This was like the supreme court to religious affairs. But you couldn't separate the Sanhedrin from the supreme court because the religious and political was one and the same in Jesus' time in first century Palestine, which always created a dilemma between whether it was secular law that the Romans wanted implemented or whether it was religious political law that the religious folks who sat on the Sanhedrin needed to have implemented. Now we encounter Nicodemus three times in the Gospel of John. Here in this text, then Nicodemus appears in the seventh chapter of John where he reminds his colleagues on the Sanhedrin that a person needed to be heard before being judged. Then he appears in the 19th chapter where he provides spices for the embalming of Jesus' body. But Nicodemus is unique to John and being unique to John infuses into Christian Christian theology, something that is a touchstone for Protestantism and Protestant evangelicalism. This is where Jesus questions the understanding of God and the Spirit with Nicodemus by saying, you must be born from above, or the way we hear it, you must be born again. The idea is perplexing to Nicodemus and he ponders whether Jesus is stating that somehow a person must re-enter the womb and be born again. Now Protestant evangelicalism focuses on this chapter and these verses framing the term born again or having a personal experience with Jesus that is wrought through the Holy Spirit. An experience of new birth, an experience of revelation, an experience of awakening and reawakening and changing one's perspective from what was known before and seeking out what is revealed now in this moment of spiritual encounter. It is a spiritual rebirth. Now you have often heard the term born again Christian as something that is different and more radical than just being Christian. Somebody says, I'm Christian, and somebody says, well, I'm a born-again Christian. And, and, and they state it in such a way that you who say you're a Christian, you're a lower-down Christian than somebody who is a born-again Christian. So, so there is a, a, a class difference, a a kind of uh, difference that comes with how somebody might use the term. And many of us on the liberal side of Christianity run far away from being born again Christian. Amen? Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? Being born again generally means in Christendom having a very personal and intimate experience with Jesus and with the Holy Spirit. In our culture, It denotes a more conservative form of Christianity, a more dogmatic form, and one that has become in this country synonymous with rigidity and often protecting the status quo. However, my assertion is that we have let people steal this from us. Because being born again doesn't mean rigidity. And it doesn't mean a more conservative point of view. But it does mean a more expansive way to see oneself and to see the world around us in relationship to God. This scripture means this. In fact, I believe that a rigid and conservative framework of being born again does not exist in this text. 
in the way that evangelical Christianity thinks that it does. I believe that this scripture depicts a dialogue between Jesus and a leader of the faith where Jesus challenges the Pharisee and the Sanhedrin member to gain new insight, develop new vision, and to begin to see things with a new consciousness and a new understanding. If you go back and to the context of the text, let me be clear. Nicodemus and who he is, Pharisaic and Sanhedrin, he represents rigidity. He represents conservatism. He represents protection of the status quo. He represents protection of all of the traditions. So when Jesus challenges him, Jesus is challenging rigidity and conservatism. Jesus is even challenging the traditions. When Jesus says, oh, you got to be born from above. In other words, you got to have new insight. You got to develop new vision. And you got to begin to see things with a new consciousness and a new understanding. Nicodemus represents the rigidity and Jesus represents God's new thing. The movement of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus is challenging Nicodemus with seeing things with a new set of eyes. Greater understanding. And to realize that where he thinks that he has represented God is actually a hindrance to the Spirit of God. Jesus is saying that the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin, and all of the religious structure is so bent on protection, protecting its traditions, its laws, and a sense of order that it is a hindrance to God. It's a hindrance to the Spirit of God. And it's a hindrance to the new thing of God that is being expressed through Jesus and presented to the world. Jesus says you've got to be born from above. In other words, you've got to be born anew. You've got to be born again. You must see the world with new sight, new vision, in order to see and understand the movement of God. Being born again is simply saying that we must draw into question all of our old notions and conceptualizations, questions of our understand, question our understandings, (coughs) re-examine our old limits, old hindrances, and see the world with eyes that God has given to us and a heart that God has reconditioned us with. We must see new things. Jesus says to Nicodemus, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. So this is perplexing to Nicodemus, and he says, how can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Now Jesus is not talking about physically going back into his mother's womb, but he's talking about going to the creator of all life, God, and beginning again with insight, vision, understanding, and a deeper knowing. You ever notice how people come and they join the church, but they don't change? All right. All right. You know what I'm talking about, right? They, 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 they're cantankerous before they came into the church, and they're cantankerous and holy and sanctified in the church. Oh, boy. Goodness you, you, or, 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 or somebody <coughs> that is racist in their perspective. And come into the church and hold on to their racism. Or hold on to their sexism. Or hold on to their homophobia. Or hold on, right? We're called to be transformed. It says, not, do not be conformed to this world. Didn't the scripture say that? But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In, in, in other words... Jesus is challenging Nicodemus 
Say, yeah, yeah, you know, I, I hear you. First thing you should understand is that Nicodemus is up there at night because Nicodemus don't want to be seen in the daylight. Nicodemus is coming, obviously, not only to inquire of Jesus more, but to try to change Jesus. And Jesus hits him with this idea of being born from above. Because, see, all the stuff around Judaism had to do with being clean, right? All of the rituals around cleanliness, all of the rituals around being perfect in body. You know, such as if you had so-called a deformity, you couldn't go into the presence of God. All of that type of stuff that folk held on to and, 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 and rooted themselves in. And Jesus comes along and Jesus says, you must be born from above. You must be born again. You must have new eyes. You must have new vision. You must have a new understanding in order to encounter God who's doing a new thing. How can you meet God who's doing a new thing if all you're bringing is all your old stuff? How, how, how can you understand that God? How can you meet that God? How can you fall in love with that God? <coughs> there are so many people who are content with the world as they know it, as they have been given it. And as they have experienced it to date, they are content even with the limitations of life. They are content with diminished hopes and dreams. They have accepted the diminishment of themselves and those around them. They are content with imposed positions and stations in life. People are always telling somebody else what is impossible. People are always telling others how something is just too hard to accomplish and that you can't do it because it has never been done before. People will fill you with fear, cautions, and will try to discourage you at every single turn. These are some of the limits that the world imposes. And we often accept those shortfalls and fear of failure because it has been fed to us all our lives. Well, we, we're black, we can't do it. We're a woman, we can't do it. Uh, uh, I have a disability, we can't do it. Uh, uh, I'm, I, 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 I didn't go to an Ivy League school. I can't do it. All the type of stuff. I, 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 don't necessarily, I, didn't, I didn't go to college at all, so I can't do it. Well, that's the stuff that the world feeds us with. Yeah. And, 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 and here, we're being called upon to see things in a new way have greater vision, a vision that doesn't come from this world or the bruises you have been bruised with in life, but vision and insight that only God and the Holy Spirit can give. Therefore, Jesus retorts to the question that Nicodemus has with the statement, the wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Now, tapping into the Spirit of God, in other words, is tapping into the power of God and the purpose of God and the meaning of God, tapping into the very life flow of God. When you tap into that power, you will have no idea where you might end up and no idea of the changes that will be made in your life or the understanding on life that will come into your life. And, and when you tap into that spirit, when you tap into that spirit, yesterday will not be like today. And tomorrow will not be like yesterday. You know, the, the, the fact is when we tap into that spirit, we're tapping into that which changes the essence of our being, change our outlook, our insight, change all of our hopes and perspective. Yeah. 
Now the word in biblical Hebrew for spirit or wind, I should say for wind, is ruah, and it also means spirit. And the word in Greek for wind, which is Greek is the word is the language of the New Testament, is pneuma, and that also means breath and spirit. The wind that Jesus refers to is filled with life and filled with spirit. We find life, new insight, new understanding, and new vision when we are filled with God and reborn. I think about this. All of the times that I've been reborn. And I mean all of the times that I've been broken by life. All of the times in which life has ground me up and ground me down. All of the times in which I went into my own psychological prayer closet to talk to God and to hope nobody else saw what I was going through. And in the midst of being broken open, being torn apart, being slayed by the circumstances of life, that's when the Spirit of God gave to me new birth and new insight and new hope. That's when God intervened. And and that's a part of what Jesus is talking about here. To get up from wherever I've been, from that low point in my life, to get up and then to all of a sudden see myself, see the world, and see God with a new vision and a new insight. To understand that the old is old and was yesterday like new wine skin. I can't put new spirit into old wine skin because it's just going to bust open. I got to put it into new wine skin now. If you understand that text, even that refrain, that, that reference that, that they talk about old and new wine skin because you see the wine is still ferment. And so if I take new wine and put it into old wine skin. All of the elasticity of the old skin has already been stretched out. And so it can't stretch out any further. It's going to burst open. So you got to put it into new wine skin in order for that skin to expand with the fermentation of the wine. Well, that's what God is doing to you. If you let God do it to you, if you let God fill you with the Spirit, if you let God touch you, if you allow yourself to be the new wineskin that encounters the Spirit of God, to understand that God is going to stretch you sometimes to the place where you don't even want to go. Seeing the world new, understanding that God is truly our strength, our sustainer, and our creator, and our recreator. Jesus is struggling to get Nicodemus to see that yes, he has what he's been given, but what he's been given is not enough. It is not all that God desires for him to have and to see and to understand. God has more for you, but we need to be born of God. We are fearful of a great many things, but we need to be filled with God. We need to forge a relationship with God in order to see and understand our worth and self-worth and all that God has for us. I said this at a midweek service and got a reaction because I, I made the statement that I don't believe that God loves everybody. And the reason I was saying that because I'm seeing things with a new eyesight, new understanding. 
Realizing the statement that God loves everybody is a statement of cheap grace. And when I say cheap grace, because it presupposes that you don't need to do anything in order for God to love you. You don't need to be in relationship with God. But how can you have love from God if you're not in a relationship with God? You know, it's just like every single relationship. It takes a courtship. It takes an understanding. It takes a commitment to be in relationship with one. And so how can you not be in relationship and expect to have the love of God? I'm not saying that God is not love. God is love. God's very nature is love. But in order for somebody to have a loving encounter from God means that they have to be in relationship with God. And what does it say in John? You can't love God who you have not seen if you hate your brother and sister that you have seen. New insight. You know, that, that, that means, that means that those who claim to have God who sit in high places and do evil things, they don't have the love of God extending to them because they got to do something in order to be engaged in a relationship with God. You see, you see it doesn't mean that we are unworthy, but it does require for us to be in relationship with God. How does anybody love anybody else if you don't know to anybody else? All right. It doesn't work. Might work in theory. It, it might work in the conceptualization of one's mind. But love is an expression that is acted out. And it's a covenant. Covenant meaning that I just don't receive something that I'm not connected with. I got to be connected and engaged and living up to some expectation in order to receive the love of the person or the being that I'm in partnership with. You see, you see, it's easy to say that God loves everybody because what that simply means is that you don't want to have God to judge anybody. But there is a judgment of right and wrong. There's a judgment of doing good or not. There's a judgment of good or evil. There's a judgment that comes if you're not in relationship with God. This is called being born again. Being born again. You see, there were times and moments where I was estranged from God. But I ended up pleading my soul to God because human beings couldn't save me, because a human being could not remake me, a human being could not save me. Only the one that created heaven and earth had the power to create and recreate. So I said, God, get me know you a little bit better. God, let me feel your presence in my life. God, touch me like you never touched me before and lift me up higher and higher and I will serve you. I will love you. I just want to know you even more and receive the love of God. New eyes, new vision, new understanding, new hope for us and new hope for this world. Sisters and brothers, Jesus came to express that new vision and that new understanding. Jesus came from heaven onto this earth. Jesus said, well, maybe you don't know God, but let me get near to you with the embodiment of God in my being. Let me touch you. Let me love you. Let me be in connection with you so that you might understand what it means to be in connection with God and with the Holy Spirit. Let me lift you in your hunger. Let me feed you in your hunger. Let me cause your eyes to see. Let me give you strength to stand on your legs. Uh, Let me cleanse you of, of leprosy, Lord. Let me do all those things so that you can be engaged in a covenant, in a relationship with God. And put new understanding in your, in your eyes. Well, nobody ever heard. Nobody ever heard that life can overcome death. That takes new insight. New vision. Nobody ever heard that once you put somebody in a tomb, 
that they can get up from a tomb. That takes a new vision and new understanding. Nobody really understood that when you get up and you're not a skeleton and you get up and there's life in you and you get up and you impart life to those who have received you, that takes new understanding and takes new vision. And you see, and this is what we're being shown all along the way, that we must be born from on high. We must be born again. We must receive the outpouring of God's love and blessing by being in relationship with God and seeing God with new eyes and a new spirit. The doors of the church are open. I pray somebody here today. You heard a word? And I invite you to come and join in relationship with this church, with Jesus, our Lord and Savior. The doors of the church are open. If you're not yet a part of the church, come forth so that we might receive you. The doors of the church are open. 
as often as you meet, do this in remembrance of me. And when you take this cup and the bread, you proclaim his death until he comes. Come and eat, come and drink. The deacons will serve you. We ask that you hold the communion till we've all been served and that we might take the communion together. Take and eat this and do it in remembrance of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 
Take and drink this and do it in remembrance of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught to us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Son Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, the people of God, say amen. Amen. amen.